day, everyone, and thank you for joining our presentation today. Uh, yeah, today we will first tell you a little bit about ourselves, then we will give you some uh, project context, and then I will tell you some particular takeaways that I've taken away from this project um, from a project manager perspective, and I will then hand over to Alex, who will tell you a little bit about the technical challenges we faced and how we've overcome them. And uh, of course, we'll leave some time for questions in the end as well. So we'll get right into it. So I'm Julie. I was born and raised in Germany, but somehow a journey around the world has led me to move to Australia about 10 years ago. And now I call this, or more specifically, Melbourne home. I have been working in the IT industry for about 15 years, seven of which I have been a project manager for. And in the last five years, I've been managing Drupal projects, mostly in the government space, working for Salsa Digital. And over to you, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, Alex uh, Skripnik, Drupal Solution Architect, uh, working in IT for 20 years, 12 of which in Drupal. Um, Joey. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll give you some project context. So, this project has some sensitivities, which, which is why this particular client has asked us to stay anonymous. However, for the context of this presentation, um, this is a federal agency in Australia, and they were operating an authenticated user portal on an old version of MS SharePoint. This was very costly for them. It was not very flexible. It was visually highly unappealing and just overall not fit for purpose. So they had gone out to market and they basically looked for a vendor to help them replace this um, authenticated user portal, migrate all of the existing data, ensure that the platform was able to um, scale up for a lot more data to come in in the future and they also wanted to create analytical reports to get business insights in the absence of Google Analytics as an option. And they also in the future will integrate with an internal publishing system. Naturally, we cannot demo the solution without revealing the agency. However, I hope that in the next 20 minutes, we will be able to give you very specific takeaways anyway uh, and make you feel like you, you know, had some good insights from this presentation. So I'll dive right in. So, first one up. One of the key tools that um, I used in the discovery phase was a content data mon model which actually Alex initiated in, in the phase. And it basically outlines all of the content types with their fields, all of the vocabularies with their fields and the relationships between them. And that was a very powerful tool to um, to myself, but also to display to the stakeholders to show, show these relationships. So let me just quickly bring this up, and I'm going to just say this is also a highly anonymized, sanitized version of the, the thing. Give me a second. All right. So it looked, find the mouse. Oh, there it is. It looked something like this. So you have a legend where you basically uh, outline the different field values and then you have your various content types with the various fields referencing the vocabularies. And then of course you have the, actually you can see there's a pretty large content data model. You have all the vocabularies with all of the fields as well. And it is really nice now, basically, what that allows you to do is, hold on, I'll come back on this side. Hey. Uh, what that allows you to do is whenever you um, basically look at any part of your project, basically, um, you can kind of cross check and find whether you're having gaps. So one simple example, you look at a Figma file and you might see there is a tooltip. And then you can quickly check your content data model and identify whether that vocabulary actually has a description field, which can then display the information in the tooltip. So little things like that just make it really easy. It's basically like a puzzle. When you're trying to puzzle, you're also looking at a an image to see how your puzzle pieces fit into that, that image. Trying to do that puzzle without it would be 
infinitely more difficult. So that's basically what a content data model can do for you. So if you ever uh, end up in, in a complex project, I highly recommend it. All right now, let me just figure out how to get here. OK, next one. Staggering work is a risk. So we all, I think, know um, projects rarely ever have a lot of time. We somehow always end up in projects where time is rare. So it's very, very uh, tempting to stagger work as much as you can. In our case, we basically went through the design discovery, and um, out of that came wireframes, and we started doing our backend work based on the wireframes before the high fidelity designs were done. And then we started the front end work. Now, of course, what happened, the UI designer went in, looked at the wireframes, thought about it a bit more, and started to tweak things. Unfortunately, those little tweaks, you know, they're not always so little to then implement once you've already done the work. So it basically puts you in a position where you're either kind of very inflexible because, you know, after all the work's done, or you need to refactor a lot of the work. Now, I'm not, uh, my takeaway here is not that you shouldn't do it, but just prepare your client and pre prepare yourself for that to happen. So if you, if you are going to stagger it like that, make sure the client is aware of that risk and is not completely surprised by the fact that you might have a few additional stories in your Jira backlog to then correct, make small corrections um, of the work that was already done. All right. And then there's accessibility. There have already been some presentations on accessibility, and uh, we also had our own personal takeaway. Um, we were asked by this client to implement a two-factor authentication uh, method by which a phone call was made on a desk phone. Uh, we couldn't, for various reasons that I can't talk about, uh, <laughs> make uh, send a message like you usually would uh, to a mobile phone. Now, we had pretty much implemented this, and we had all the various screens where the user was asked to do A, B, and C. And uh, I had gone to our accessibility specialist, and I said, hey, can you please have a look at these screens, make sure, you know, people can look, uh, tab through them, and, you know, it's, it's all accessible. And she looked at the screens, and she said, yeah, truly your, your screens are fine, but, you know, how is a hearing imp impaired person going to enter this code? And I literally just stood there and I had this, huh, right, yeah, no. And yeah, it was, it was one of those moments where I think we were all kind of baffled by the fact that we had just not considered that. So yeah, for various reasons, we moved away from this uh, solution and we moved towards other solutions. But yeah, definitely, um, and I think Philippa mentioned it today as well in her presentation, just make sure you consider accessibility all the way through. Sometimes it can be tempting to focus on a problem and how to solve it. Just make sure you solve it for all users. And this one was a fun one too. So we had this incredibly tight timeline and we had delivered all of these uh, beautiful designs to the uh, various stakeholders and the stakeholders came back and they said, this looks fantastic, this is awesome, go for it. There was literally no feedback. It's like, great, that's fantastic, because we have no time, so you know, let's, let's just move on. And there was this little voice in my head that said, eh, but you know, it was, very it was very convenient to have no feedback when you're on a very tight timeline. And guess what happened? As Soon as we built the thing, stakeholders came back and they're like, well, Obviously, you know, we need that banner to be smaller. And I was like, obviously, huh? <laughs> Wish I had known that earlier, because of course, at that point, it is so much more expensive, so much more time consuming to correct these things. So my takeaway from you is, for you is that if you ever get no feedback, you probably just need to ask more questions, go into another meeting with those stakeholders, talk them through in more detail, because more likely than not, they have just not spent enough time looking at these designs. <clears throat> the devil's in the detail. The Germans say the devil is a squirrel. Don't ask me why. So, get stakeholders across it. Or maybe just adjust your expectations. What do I mean? We had gone through, uh, you know, basically, 
months and months of project, like months and months, and we get to this day, this go life day, and we are so excited. And we get there. And a week later, within a week, we get a list of enhancement requests. It's literally like 30 or so requests. And it was literally for, I, I remember talking to the tech lead, I was like, how did this happen? You know, how did this happen? We demoed every two weeks. UAT got done within a week of every sprint closing. It was, you know, that we, we literally, the content editors were some of the key stakeholders. We'd given them a training really, you know, weeks and weeks in advance of the actual go live so they could go in and they could start having a play with the platform. And really, I felt like we had everything. We've we'd done everything. The, um, the uh, product owner was highly engaged and really tried his best to get all of the stakeholder feedback as well. So, you know, what could we have done differently? Initially, I thought, well, maybe we should have brought the, the stakeholders more across the Jira stories, actually like shared all that detail with them. But looking at it and looking at the feedback again, I realized, no, it, it would have been across the board. They couldn't have read every Jira story. So my conclusion was, you actually have to expect it. If you run a very, very complex project of that size, you probably will only really test it when you do go live. So have a week, have two weeks, have a hypercare sprint where you actually can just take that feedback on board. Also mentally prepare yourself for that to happen. We were really kind of disappointed. But I think if you expect it, you can, you know, and the client expects it and everyone expects it, then you kind of say, hey, you know what, we'll go live, we'll probably get some more feedback, we'll have a sprint for that, and we'll have budget for that. So that was that takeaway. And this gets me to search. Now, it's not the first time, it is not the first time that this has happened to me in a Drupal project. So this is why I've chosen to include this. Um, <laughs> Search filters are always difficult to implement because people have very, very strong views of how they should behave. In our case, the client wanted faster search combined with view filters in a toolbar above the search results, essentially wanting the results to refresh without the page refreshing, and also comb combining that with checkboxes to either include or exclude certain results. So, Drupal provides about 90% of that out of the box with the faceted um, and search API, API modules, but to override and tweak those last 10% turned out to be very, very, very tricky. So yes, if you ever see faceted search in your designs, just add a bit more risk, add a bit more time because you will likely need it. <clears throat> and lastly, transparency is key. We had bi-weekly detailed project reports delivered to the client, which um, very clearly outlined uh, how we were traveling from a budget perspective, how we were going on risk, what challenges we were facing, how, how we were burning down. Um, really everything was in there very detailed, but also we had a weekly check-in with them where we would go through that and we would just basically put everything on the table. So there was literally a no surprise environment for this client. They knew things when we knew things and they could help us solve the problems we were facing. Um, we also had, of course, daily stand-ups and retrospectives. It just helped the client make informed decisions, really. I think it can sometimes be tempting to either hide or maybe underrepresent mistakes or challenges. But really, when you have a large, complex project, they are unavoidable both on the supplier side and on the client side. So I think it is my responsibility as an engagement manager to make sure that I create an environment where everyone is comfortable sharing whatever needs to be shared to make good decisions together. And that's it for now for me, and I'll hand over back to you, Alex. Thank you, Julie. Um, very interesting insights in that. Um, my side is more on solutions. Um, I just want to start with the fact that uh, government projects are harder than normal projects, and secure government projects are 10 times harder. 
Well, I think. Um, we have multiple items here. Uh, just going to fly through them. Infrastructure. Um, by definition of that project, we had to come up with the uh, infrastructure that would uh, adhere to government security controls. Um, not just some, but like 750. That's just quite a lot of controls to, to adhere to. Um, and uh, we also had to go through the internal assessment and accreditation. Um, well, we, uh, we did spend a couple of months there. Um, that was a bit challenging, but we went through uh, just flying colors, I would say. Um, but on the solution side, uh, we looked into multiple uh, vendors and uh, ended up with having a dedicated AWS account and uh, uh, amazing team helped us to set up a Lagoon cluster. Uh, and a part of that, we also had to go through baseline clearance, um, which is another interesting um, exercise. Uh, if you work with government projects. Um, so yeah, our team, our internal team had to go through this, this process of getting this uh, certification done. And another part of that infrastructure was to build security internet gateway. Um, again, we looked into several options. Um, we we're quite uh, happy with solution that Amazi provided to us, which was based on Fastly. Um, also, that had a firewall, and the good thing about that, that the client was able to have a tiered access to that uh, solution to be able to configure and add rules and have certain logging um, available. And then uh, another part was the content migration. Um, this was hard, um, not only because it was a lot of content, so 100. 100,000 um, content items and uh, data assets. Uh, but it also was like 25 data structures. But it also has to be sanitized, which I'm going to touch in a second. Um, on implementation side, um, for those of you who have done migrations, well, migrations are hard because you need to have a process of you know, how to validate that whatever you're migrating is actually have been migrated correctly. Um, we have came up uh, with the process of uh, having a validation and uh, nightly builds. So we would run the migration overnight and uh, like with a fresh install and um, that, that would uh, show us what kind of defects we would have. And we'll have a next day to rectify those defects and have another run. And then the, on the validation side, we would uh, pick a randomly we will select randomly a, a set of data um, and we would share it with the uh, customer and the customer would uh, collaborate with us to um, basically uh, validate that the data was migrated uh, correctly. And we would repeat that like for two or three months um, and basically everyone would uh, be very comfortable with the fact that everything went through smoothly and we would have all that data migrated. So we actually, nothing you know, fell off. And as a part of that migration exercise, um, since we are running multiple uh, non-production environments, uh, you know, migration environment, development environment, pull request environments, um, and there is also a production environment, um, we needed to <coughs> minimize security footprint and we needed <coughs> to log all the access um, uh, to, the, uh, to the content assets because we, even within our team, we had a tier access, so only uh, solution architect, which is me, and technical lead uh, had access to production data. Everyone else in the team, including developers and QA, um, they did not. So we needed to find us something to sanitize it, some, some way to sanitize the data, but at the same time, uh, allow to validate that whatever we're migrating is actually there. The way we achieved it is uh, by using separate uh, AWS three buckets. So we would have um, a bucket with the data, which is sanitized, um, attached to our development environment. And then overnight, we would use this amazing module um, that I highly recommend to everyone, uh, GDPR Drupal module, that you can provide the configuration to specify which fields uh, on your, in your source database uh, get sanitized. And sanitization rules themselves can be a random field or 
sorry, random value or a empty value or something like that. Uh, and you can specify for any field. And then there is another pretty cool module where it's actually packaged, GDPR MySQL dump. That is a that plugs in into Drush command. And what happens is if you run your Drush SQL dump, it actually streams that uh, through that uh, GDPR uh, Drupal module and it uh, dumps the database um, with already sanitized data. So you don't have to, normally you would have to have another database where you uh, take the production database, import it into the second one, and then run sanitization, and then export that one. This module allows to do it uh, like on the fly. And so you don't, you don't need to have a second database. Practically, we would run another job uh, in production by um, dumping database into this dedicated S3 bucket. I'm actually, if anyone interested, I'm happy to talk about it more. Um, we probably gonna implement it on all, all our uh, other projects, this approach, because what happens is, uh, it's not only that you sanitize the data, but also you can re significantly reuse the size of the database. So if your production database is like three, five, 10 gigabytes, you can actually go down to 100 megabytes uh, quite easily. And then that database can be moved to like CI environment or local environment, uh, which is, yeah, it speeds up the development time. Uh, and yeah, and also the kind of funny one is that the dummies, we needed to, since we were dealing with not only with content, but also with files, um, there were lots of PDFs, um, but no one could see what, what's inside. Um, so we needed to create PDFs that looked like or named like the original files, but containing some uh, dummy content. We needed that so that uh, all the internal linking and all the entity linking and file linking would work. So the QA team could actually validate that whatever was migrated uh, would, you know, be, uh, would work together and I guess referenceable. Uh, so yeah, we created a couple of scripts to just replace real files with dummy files. Um, and this is, this is the, the, the most interesting part. So one of the phases of the project was, uh, after we've done the migration, the original migration of that 100,000 items, um, there was another data source. And we needed Drupal <laughs> to work with 1.2 terabytes of data. And yeah, terabytes, not gigabytes, yeah and with 500 gigabytes of data uh, growth every month, uh, sorry, every year, every year. So that is quite a lot of data. Um, and um, that also has to be searchable. Um, we looked around and we'll be like, mm, can Drupal handle this? Um, it's good that we were all on AWS already. So we looked at solutions and uh, Open search, yes. So open search is elastic. It's a fork of elastic search, um, but it's in AWS, so available as a service, cloud-based. So what we did was we used this module, again, pretty cool module called external entities. Uh, what it does, uh, and elastic search connector, of course. Uh, what it does, it's you can have your nodes or your entities uh, sitting within a third-party system like Elasticsearch or OpenSearch in this case, and then create a mapping for the fields so that those entities appear uh, to Drupal as they are no normal nodes. And then you can use views, you can use whatever infrastructure or structure of Drupal you need to just communicate with them. And you can use Search API to actually build the search um, so yeah, that 1.2 terabytes of data is the problem itself was solved like that. And the, uh, open search is fast, right? And if we need more um, space, it's cloud-based. So we just we just uh, increase the size. And I think it goes, I believe one web head there goes up to four terabytes. So for the next maybe five years, we're fine. Four or five years, we're fine. And then uh, we'll see if there's another option. Um, yeah, I'm just going to fly through this one. So another option, uh, another point was to do a, a visual uplift. And um, some of you have seen Civic Theme, which is behind you right now on the screen. <laughs> um, uh, that's uh, open source uh, Drupal theme and component-based library uh, developed by Salsa Digital. 
And we've used it an early version to basically uplift visually uh, this project. And the good stuff from all of this was that we were able to validate Civic Theme as a design theme um, quite early in the process. And uh, that was good because we also have, we were able to do like a Drupal theme, uh, to, uh, produce a Drupal theme out of it. Um, and on the business side, that actually saved about 80% of the front end budget since everything, uh, since 80% uh, uh, was done in the Civic theme. Uh, but we did spend time on that uh, search, yeah, which was not covered by Civic Team, because uh, yeah, search is hard. Um, one of the features of this platform uh, was a uh, subscription system. Um, there are some, some subscription modules available in Drupal, um, Contrib Space, but they all, uh, let's say, limited for a reason to a certain you know, no types or other things um, didn't didn't fit us. So we looked in the custom solution. Basically, what we needed to do is there will be a content type, or well, actually a content with fields and which like taxonomy, and then the members of the portal would subscribe to changes based on taxonomy and um, would produce some sort of daily digests. And the number of variants uh, multiplied by number of users was like a hundred thousands. So we couldn't basically, it's like a, a mail merge. If you know what mail merge, if you heard of it, uh, every user would get some sort of customized uh, experienced uh, subscription email. Um, yeah, so if we, yeah, so we, we decided to just go with batching. Uh, and so we would batch, uh, production of this unique um, permutations, I would, I would say, of content updates with who they have to be sent to, um, like through a queue. So we'd have a queue running and just calling for these uh, updates, listening uh, which con what kind of content has been changed and who should receive it. And then based on that, it will be a second queue. It will be like pre-rendering emails, uh, well, actually email content. So, so we can then pass it to a uh, next system um, to actually send this kind of hundred thousands of emails. And I think we're talking about like uh, 10,000 emails per day. No, uh, five, five, about 5,000. So it's, it's a lot um, for, for a Drupal site. Um, again, looked places and they'd be like, okay, we already have an AWS account. Why don't we look at the, one of the services, which is a simple email service. So SES. Um, uh, surprisingly, this was the easy part because we already had a system that was generating emails. It was just a matter of passing them uh, over to the system that would be sending them. And that was, uh, that was okay. So one thing we had to be um, uh, considered is the sender reputation. So sender reputation is something that, um, that you need to monitor. So if you send an email and it will be marked as spam, and many people are going to market a spam, your sender reputation may go down and uh, your account may be blocked by uh, Amazon. Uh, it doesn't matter how much money you pay to them, they just, they just consider that. So this, this is the spam prevention technique. Uh, so really, I have to be uh, monitoring that. And if, some, if something happens, you need to like respond to their emails uh, to Amazon and you explain why, what kind of content you send into them. So, um, that uh, sender reputation doesn't go down. Um, I guess the last part of the system that we built was analytics. And um, yeah, so we needed to build a secure analytics system um, and we needed to allow uh, administrative users uh, to be able to customize existing or create new uh, re uh, reports for analytics. Um, users usually like, they know how to use Google Analytics and they get used to the fact that that's very flexible and powerful and for a reasons of data sovereignty and uh, personal data storage. We couldn't use that. Uh, again, we looked around what's available in open source space uh, and Matomo. Uh, it, it appeared to be quite a robust system. Uh, very, very nice on the UI as well. So all the um, I guess the, our, our users liked that, so they, they were able to build uh, 
robust reports and complex reports with the data. Uh, and our solution actually sits within AWS as well. So um, I would say thanks to the um, Lagoon uh, implementation that we've used and whole Docker container based system, we just spun up another container, uh, uh, which we had to, like our internal team did it. So we didn't have to involve uh, anyone external to do that for us. So now we have this Matomo um, running in a container in our AWS. And we have, I think we even have a, a development instance of that if we need to play with it. Uh, and we have uh, analytics basically uh, feeding into an internal system and it's kind of closed loop. Um, that's it from my technical side of things. So back to you, Julie. Thank you. All right, I have a final conclusion. Um, finding the right people for this job is critical to the success. So this was obviously, as you can tell, a highly complex project and we've not even told you half of it. And um, I really attribute a lot of the success to the fact that we really just had exactly the right team on this project. We had a very strong technical lead who was approachable and a very good communicator. We had a very strong solution architect and Alex who would make sure that all these solutions were found and would fit together. We had a migration engineer who has had years of experience in migrations and could literally foresee challenges before we saw them and he literally smashed through these 25 different migration scripts. Um, we had a front-end developer who had loads of years and years of experience in front-end but also particularly in uh, div um, implementing uh, design system, uh, I guess, front end based on design systems. And uh, we did have a developer who could do a little bit of all trades, you know, was good at front end and good at back end. And uh, a very thorough QA who really also looked at the big picture, which is, I think, really important um, because otherwise you'll find the problems when the thing goes live. And a strong partner in Amazi uh, for the infrastructure side of things and a very strong design partner in Oliver Grace who made sure that that visual uplift happened and the users would now actually enjoy using the portal. And lastly, but not to be forgotten at all, we had a, a good product owner on client side. We had a great project manager on client side. They were able to make decisions. They really involved the stakeholders. The stakeholders were knowledgeable. Basically, it all really came together really well. And I guess that's my opportunity to also just acknowledge that. And that's it. Questions? Ah, sorry. I'll try and speak louder. Uh -huh. um, so just a question around uh, working with the federal agency and data is quite sensitive and all that sort of stuff. I'm just curious to know why there wasn't any considerations given to unit testing or selenium testing for this stuff. Oh, we have tests for everything automated. Uh, we even had tests for the validation of migrations. The visual was for the human, the 10% the, the of what you can, uh, cannot automate. So we needed someone to look at things as a, from human side. Is that does that make sense? Or so they so there were unit tests, but not so much we, client tests. For, we we did have we do have and we did have um, unit tests, uh, functional tests, front end tests, but they will be testing generic things, not the actual content of the migrations. So we needed the human to actually test that. So coming through probably. Yeah. I actually just have a comment more than a question. You said that the, when you um, handed it over, you then got a list of 30 enhancements. Yes. When we did the CASA website last year, we had a beta version up publicly for three months, not one bit of feedback. When we went live, there were two months, the storm of emails was, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. And we said to everybody, but it's been up there. Like, why haven't yeah. you looked at it? Yeah. So I completely sympathize. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it hurt a little bit. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you both for the talk. Uh, my questions are on the open search data. How are you managing the backups and restores into that, uh, that data store? We are using 
I can't. Can I answer that later? Yes. <laughs> or, or, or not at all? <laughs> um, you have to answer it later. There are. I, I, what I can say is that for every AWS three bucket, uh, we have a second bucket which logs access to the first one, and we have like thirty buckets. Now, to answer your question about uh, that open search, we do have a backup system, but um, it's not AWS. So we have like a offline data backup system. Now, whether that is I, 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 sorry, I can't. That's all right. I just can't say more than we, we do have that. We've managed the backup, but yes, yeah, sure. The that amount of data um, restoring that is problematic. Yes. So as in, like it's long, and the way to restore it would be to speed up another instance, import it, and then do a switch. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, so it's not. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, no. So, are they, you talked a little bit about there's a GDPR uh, module for sanitizing databases. Yep. You also said you can use it to squash the size of your That's database. That's right, yep. And it's easy? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, what happens is, uh, two, so two parts, right? So, you have a Drupal module, yep. and then you have this package that is um, basically you replace Drush SQL dump with Drush SQL dump dash sanitize or something. Yeah. Right, so you just change the command, and in the Drush, uh, sorry, in the Drupal GDPR module, you specify the configuration of the fields, so how you exactly want to sanitize them, and the Drush command uh, that just uh, exports it. So first module configuration, second one is actually uh, action to, to do it. Uh, how hard? It, array. <laughs> it's array of fields, and then you just specify if it's a uh, uh, empty to empty or empty as in field em to empty the field or put a random number or put a random lorem ipsum so you choose and if you actually put lot empty there are lots of empty fields that will squash your database because you will have no content and obviously you, you were you mostly using an external uh, data system for your storage so presumably that still kind of works even though you're no longer using a, like a local database Okay, so can you? So you're using an asset storage search to store your data. Yeah. And this, well, I mean, I'm going to assume the answer is yes because you did it. But this still works even though your data, uh, your data is external. You're not kind of storing it in a yeah, so traditional database. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So what happens is uh, there is a there is a, uh, a connector that can well, just basically sorry. There is a config, there is external uh, there is a module called external entities, right? Yeah. That module is connected with the fields and uh, a URL to Elasticsearch. Yeah. So every time there is an internal Drupal um, programmatical or API or whatever request to that, you know, like node slash one two three, yeah. um, that actually knows that that entity type is external, and that goes to the Elasticsearch, uh, and retrieves it and uh, pulls it back. And also, there is a caching mechanism as well. So you can even set it up so that most, the, the one that you retrieve the most, uh, cached inside of Drupal. So you can still store. Imagine if you have like historical data, like only a handful of them, or hundreds, or even a thousand of them is used. You can cache that one thousand, but your other million records can store that can be stored in Elasticsearch and uh, accessed a little bit slower. I'm happy. Sorry, I'm happy to talk about that more in detail if you want. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.